I started with this, to get to here, to eventually build something like this. So if you ever wonder what it's like to mill your own lumber without knowing how to mill your own lumber, keep watching. It wasn't hard at all. The fact that I'm staring at you, not looking happy, means one thing. I'm just gonna come out and say it. This is not a how-to video. This is a how to not do what I'm doing video. There's this problem with YouTube and really the internet at large that just because you publish something to the internet, it doesn't make you, the publisher, correct or even an authority on the subject. On the contrary, just to be clear, being able to leave a comment on a video absolutely does make you correct and an authority. As some of you courageously demonstrate so passionately from your parents' basement behind your Cheeto stand keyboard, was that too passive aggressive? Anyways, I don't know the first thing about milling your own lumber, and I unknowingly made about every mistake you can make doing a project like this. But what I do know is that if you mill your own lumber or buy too good to be true cheap slabs on Snapface from Uncle Cletus, who has a chainsaw, there are at least three ways you're going to lose that game. First, wood needs to be dried evenly. Second, it needs to be dried to the point where fungus dies. And third, as you can see here, it needs to be dried above 135 degrees to sterilize any insects who are living rent-free inside, lest those insects decide to live rent-free inside the home of where the furniture will end up. Now, I thought if I held onto the slab for four years, that it would be enough time for it to dry. And I was mostly right, but those last two, fungus and bugs, they snuck up on me. And as you'll see in this video, they proved to be a challenge to deal with. Now at this point in the project, I've gone from excited to finally work on the slab to believing this is all going to be a waste of time and the slab will end up in the fire pit because of bugs and rot. Look at this rot. There's about three inches along the edge of the slab that is essentially a sponge and not usable. Now another challenge that I ran into is my thickness planer is only about 12 inches wide and this slab is 15 to 16 inches wide. So I wasn't sure how I was going to get a jointed face. I thought about making a slab flattening jig with a router, but I didn't feel like doing that. So I tried an experiment. I wanted to see if I could use my drum sander to act like a planer and if by flipping the face over each pass, if it would eventually true itself up. I've never done this before and here's how it turned out. Well, we have good news, bad news, and more good news. The good news is that this experiment with the drum sander totally worked. The bad news is that about three inches along one side where the rot was suspected and where the mushrooms were growing, that is completely separating, and I'm going to lose that part of the wood, which is actually good. It's good that I expose it. We want to know that that's there. But what I'm really excited about is if I chip that away, it should bring the overall width of this board to under 12 inches, which means I can finish this up with the thickness planer, I think but I'm sweating like crazy. It's 89 degrees in here. That'll have to wait for tomorrow. I'm gonna regroup, cool down, think through the next steps, but I consider this uh, a big win that we have something that I think is workable, but there's a ton of cracks and knot holes. We're gonna have to address that, but this is beautiful wood for being what it is. Now you may be wondering, why have you held onto the slab of pecan for four years and wouldn't it be cheaper to just go buy some proper pecan for your project? And those are fair questions. But the problem is my dad used to mow lawns and we had a close family friend that we looked up to and he would take care of their lawn. They had a pecan tree and one day I brought one of their pecans home and as little boys do, I dug a hole and planted it, and no surprise, it grew into a tree, which was a crazy thing for a eight-year-old boy to see. I loved that tree for sentimental reasons and because I planted it. And then my brother got a Dalmatian puppy named Star, and she chewed on the bark of that young little tree and killed it. I hated Star. So since I was a little boy, I dreamed of building my own home one day and having a pecan tree in the backyard, Sands Dalmatian. So in 2016, when we bought an abandoned lot in downtown San Antonio, I was delighted to find that the only good tree on the lot was a pecan tree. We saved it, we protected it, and we designed our custom home around the placement of this tree. And I started sketching out ways in my head to build a treehouse fort for my boys one day. Because the only thing better than a pecan tree is a pecan tree with a fort. 
Two years after we moved into our home, we had a freak hailstorm in the summer of Texas. Come on, people. And I watched my beloved pecan tree sway in the wind and come dangerously close to crashing on our new home and our neighbor's roof. Then our doorbell camera caught our neighbor's pecan tree falling down, crashing into both of our fences and almost taking out the power line. So we hired a crew to take down my beloved pecan tree. And if you're keeping score at home, here it is. Now, as my friend was cutting the trunk into firewood, I dared him to freehand cut a slab out of the trunk. I thought he'd say no, because it's kind of a ridiculous request. That's not how you do it. But he actually gave it a try. And while it wasn't perfectly flat, I thought it was good enough to try to make something out of. So that's why I've held onto the slab for four years, waiting for an idea worth using the slab for. I thought about making some wooden mallets out of this, but that didn't seem right. And I was about to give up on what to do when I got a call from Daddy Festool. The idea for this table came to me a few months ago when I was invited to join a few other creators at Festool's headquarters for a charity build-off event. Our team was given two maple live edge slabs, some walnut, and 12 hours to come up with a finished piece that would be auctioned off for charity. Someone, I think Tyler, had the bright idea of doing a live edge round table where the live edge is in the middle of the table, but without epoxy. Sorry, Cam. Since time was of the essence, we split into sub teams and it was up to Sam and I to figure out how to make the top of the table by lunch. I forgot how much fun it is to work with and collaborate with other creative people. Most of the time I'm working by myself in my shop and editing videos by myself. It can get pretty isolating and lonely. But one of my favorite parts of the trip was getting to see Sam, the DIY Huntress, use the Domino for the first time. Not just any Domino, she got to use the big XL700 Domino, one I haven't even used. She was scared at first, but with some coaching from the legendary Sedge, she did great, so great, that I took it upon myself to rebrand her social media channels from DIY Huntress to Domino Huntress. If you don't know Sam, she grew up on a construction site with her dad and is a force to be reckoned with. Check out her channel. And once we finished the table, I was tasked with making the stitches that we planned on inlaying in said top. And with that responsibility came the chance to use a tool that I've seen on YouTube, but I've never used the Shaper Origin. I'm not going to lie. I was legitimately scared to mess up using this thing, and I was totally intimidated by the tool. But upon further review of this footage, I think I found the source of intimidation. Also, Russ from Shaper still owes me $5 for losing a bet in the airport. And this is what the finished table looked like. Not bad for a bunch of pretend woodworkers on social media in 12 hours. Oh, and actually, my favorite moment of the trip was this shot right here, where it totally looks like I'm teaching Sedge what a track saw is. Now, before I made a single cut, I wanted to test the viability of being able to pull off a design like this. So I took this picture into Photoshop and did some virtual woodworking with the mouse to give me an idea of how this would look based off my inspiration from the charity event. The rough exterior of the slab made it really hard for me to visualize. So I did this process again after I planed the surfaces down and cleaned up the rot. I was shocked to see just how much of the slab I lost due to rot and cracking. I'm guessing about 40% of the pecan was lost due to me not knowing what I'm doing. Now, if you ever wanna do something like this, Photoshop is cool, but you don't need to use that. You can just print a picture out and cut it in half like I did here. And this was actually very helpful for me to understand in a tangible way with my hands where I wanted to make all of my cuts and it proved to be a very useful point of reference as I made my cuts. At this point, I felt like I had a solid piece of pecan to work with and was hopeful that I would have enough usable wood to have a meaningful project, but I was still worried about the bugs that I would continually see coming out of the wood as I worked. I felt that the moisture content was fine and the rot was addressed, but those pesky bugs really had me wondering. Now there was still a little bit of spongy wood here on the edges, but I figured I could place them on the outside of the table and cut them off when I make my circle. I usually feel like I'm not a great woodworker because I often don't know what I'm doing and I work really slow, which is something that doesn't come off in these videos. So to give you an example, here's an unedited clip of me trying to figure out what the heck I need to do. It's boring, but I think I stared at these pieces for 30 minutes trying to work out my next steps in my head before I took a blade to it. 
Woodworking is never as fast and easy and as perfect as it comes across in these videos. Now the way that my mind works, I was having a hard time visualizing how these angles would meet and how the live edge transition would look. So I tried a couple of different methods of cutting and made some mistakes, cut those mistakes off. And eventually I just decided go for it. And I did my best to cut a straight line that would join up on both pieces, making this kind of Pac-Man shape. But this is a problem that I ran into. All right, this is what I was fearing because of that cut had to be so severe, it was going to trail off, which it did, which means you can see this transition because this is where the blade exited the cut. Now I could get rid of that or minimize that if I moved this up and it would be a little bit better transition. However, I'm sacrificing my diameter because I'm gonna be cutting off a lot over here cutting off a lot over here. So I think what I'm gonna do, you can see I've already marked it out, is I want that live edge transition to start right about here. And I'm gonna use the Rotex sander to roughly carve and shape this area. And I think that'll look a little bit better than just having a straight cut. Once I inlay the walnut stitches, you know, there will be one right about here. You really won't notice that. So we just, Need to do some subtle sh shaping there. And at the end, this will all look pretty good. I need to set the record straight. If you ever hear me mention another creator by name, it's because I admire them and I want you to know about them and or I want to give a playful jab at them once again, because I like them. Sarcasm is my love language. The reason I tell you this is that if you're new to the channel, you might not pick up on my subtle sarcasm and it may come across like I have a real problem with people and I'm airing it out publicly on social media. And if you've thought that, that's totally fair. So it's time to let you in on the secret so that you can get a laugh. Regularly, people comment and ask what the beef is between me and Jason Bent. Because in most of my videos, I include some sort of subtle or not so subtle roast to him, which reminds me, if you haven't unsubscribed from Ben's Woodworking already, go ahead and do that right now. See, that's what I'm talking about. Now here's the backstory. I first met Jason about two years ago. I had 4,000 subscribers and was about to quit YouTube. He had 200,000 at the time. And one day I got a notification that he had subscribed to my channel. I was shocked that he had come across one of my videos and liked it and subscribed. So I reached out to him on Instagram to thank him and tell him I was a big fan of his. And since then we became friends and talk almost every week. He's helped me understand how YouTube works and sometimes I get to help him on his videos. I'm indebted to him because he's one of the first big YouTubers who I connected with when I was starting. Now, I was shocked that someone I'd watched for a long time and learned from liked my videos and subscribed. I still can't get over that. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Last year, without any warning, he published a video about cabinet tricks, and in the middle, out of nowhere, he said this. It takes all the layout marking errors out of the equation and is almost dummy-proof. Unless your name is Drew Witt. We had a good laugh and in a strange way, I felt honored. I thought it was hilarious and decided that I'd return the favor without telling him. Now this wasn't my plan, but in almost every video since, while editing the video, a random joke or jab about Jason will just naturally come to mind and I'll just throw it in there. I never tell him and one of my favorite things to do is publish a video and then I wait for him to call me so that we can both laugh about it. So if you ever hear a subtle joke about a fellow creator, it's not because I'm immature and petty and I'm airing grievances passive aggressively on the internet. It's because we're all friends and we're trying to keep this thing fun and interesting, mostly for ourselves, but also for those of you who can pick up on it. This is one of the many Easter eggs that I hide in my videos so that those who pay close attention can get a little extra reward for doing so. And for clarification, the inverse is true. If I never mention a fellow creator, it's because I don't like them. That's why you never hear me talk about Lincoln Street Woodworks on my channel. See, now you don't know if I'm being serious or if I actually like John. So I'm just gonna leave you hanging and let you figure it out. This table was initially gonna be a coffee table, but because of the size of the wood and all of the rot that I had to deal with, it seemed like a side table was more likely. And when I continued to see small insects come out of the pecan, I thought there's a good chance that this lives outside and that assumes that I can even make something usable. I researched a bunch of DIY solutions to deal with the insects, but I kept coming back to the reality that I needed professional help if there was any chance of this table coming inside my house. This is Danny. He claims that he can save my project. 
Danny runs the woodshed in Arlington, Texas, and he was nice enough to make an exception and open up his vacuum kiln right in the middle of a run so that we could insert my top and get it to cook for a week at 145 degrees so that I could get this video out quick. And what was surprising to me was how affordable it was to have a pro dry your beloved pecan wood. Danny charges 15 cents per board foot per day until wood reaches 6 to 8% moisture content. He's got so many unique slabs and does a ton of epoxy integrations. I saw this table that looked like a Blacktail Studio special, and when I sent a video of it to Cam, he gave Danny the ultimate compliment. In the beginning, I had no clue how to do epoxy tables until I started watching his videos and got inspired. Dude, now we do a lot of tables. If you're new to the channel, I want to say thank you for clicking on a dumb title and thumbnail and making it this far in the video. Hopefully by now you've picked up that we're all about sawdust and sarcasm, and I try to make you laugh while showing you some basic woodworking. So with that said, it's time to play a little game. I'm going to fix my 90 degree shop situation because I'm tired of sweating. And while I do that, I'm going to attempt to sneak famous movie lines past you that subscribers have challenged me with. My job is to make it not so obvious. Your job is to sniff me out. If you want to play along and get a prize, I'm going to give away my latest product, this trim router base and dust chute attachment to the first 10 people who get all the references with the time codes. Submission details are in the description box below the like button. Oh, one more thing, giveaways bring in scammers, so please note that I will not message you asking for money, for shipping, or anything like that, so if you see that, it's a scam. I like warm hugs, but I don't like warm shops in the summer. Right now, there's been weeks of what 100 degree heat, which means it's usually 90 degrees in my shop. And when I got an estimate to have a pro install a mini split for $7,000, I thought it's a trap. Thankfully, Mr. Cool makes a ductless mini split that can be installed without the assistance of a pro. The secret is their patented pre-charged quick line sets. The refrigerant is already in the lines, which means you don't need any special vacuum equipment. I was prepared for a headache when installing this, even if it was just a flesh wound, but it couldn't have been easier. You don't have to settle for an inferior mini split, where the motto is basically 60% of the time, it works every time. These units are legit and come with a standard seven year compressor warranty and a five year parts warranty. The DIY ductless mini split system is a heat pump, which means it can heat and cool throughout the different seasons. Now, if you like being uncomfortable in your shop, I seriously doubt your commitment to sparkle motion. So get comfortable today at MrCoolDIY.com. And if you skip this part of the video, I only have one thing to say. You're killing me, Smalls. All right, this is kind of embarrassing. Um, I'm kind of against putting tons of stuff in storage and then never using it, except when it's really good hardwood and you run out of space in your garage workshop. And I've been holding on to some stuff for a while. But I think right here, I have some hickory which is supposed to be basically the same thing or very similar to pecan. It says hickory on the side. So hopefully I can use these without having to buy more wood. I've hit so many roadblocks with trying to make a useful furniture piece from this pecan slab that it would be nice to have a quick win under my belt. So the plan is, while the bugs are getting cooked by Danny in his $90,000 vacuum kiln that I totally want, I'm going to make a simple base using some hickory that I had on hand, hoping that it will match the pecan. I came across this design on Instagram, and I love how simple it is, and I think it'll be pretty easy to build. I thought the easiest way to go about it would be to use floating tenons to join legs one and two together, and then use the domino to add legs three and four separately into the sides. But because I've never done this before, I ran into a problem that I didn't think about. The thing I wanna show you is if I make up a piece like this, because I'm going to mortise and tenon these in, if I don't adjust the template on this, you'll see that that reveal, whatever you want to call it, that shape is not even. But if on these pieces, I take off about 5 eighths of an inch all the way down on two of the legs, it will look normal. I have an internet friend named Seth who is a great designer in Fusion 360. I sent him my reference image from Snapface and I asked if he could make me a template file for my 3D printer so I could cut the rough pattern out on the bandsaw and then use a pattern bit on my router table to trim it up flush. Now, since my 3D printer bed is only 256 millimeters wide, we added dovetail joints to make the template fit together like a puzzle. So for all of you who say that I don't know how to do dovetails, this template is proof that you're 
going to write. Now, 3D printing has become a surprisingly useful tool in my workshop over the past three years, and this is a great example of what you can do with a 3D printer. Now, side note, for the last year, I've been working on a video about 3D printing specifically for woodworkers. It'll be done in a few months. And when I got into 3D printing a few years ago, I wasted so much time and money trying to learn this technology that I'd love to save you that learning curve. There's so many bad YouTube videos out there on the subject, and most of them are a waste of your time. And I want to make one single video without any fat in it that'll get you 80% of the way there. So if you're a woodworker and you're interested in getting into 3D printing for our hobby specifically, drop a question you have in the comment section and that'll help me make a video that actually helps you save time, money, and curse words. So this next section I thought about cutting out completely because it's really embarrassing. Because I went so slow on the router table and was too lazy to clean my pattern bit, I got a lot of burning. I struggled with how to sand these curved surfaces and tried all kinds of methods and ultimately failed. I kept thinking, if I had a spindle sander, this would be easy. And after the fourth failed method, I remembered that I did in fact have a spindle sander. It was just on a storage rack hiding behind some boxes collecting dust. I think that working out in the heat before I got the mini split installed eventually caught up with me. You see this rust on the top of my neglected sander? I didn't want to spend the time cleaning it up, which meant it stained the faces of the hickory. So the time I thought I'd save by being lazy was spent cleaning up the legs. Have you ever made a base that doesn't sit flat or even on the floor in rocks? I hate it when that happens. So I'm trying a trick where I pin and reference both feet against these MFT stops by TSO. The thought is that these will help keep these feet true and in plane with each other during the glue up. And to my surprise, it not only worked, but I didn't mess it up. Now since I'm using the German floating tenon magic machine for legs three and four, the shortest dominoes I had would run into each other if I didn't intervene. But there's an easy fix. Boom. See, now I don't feel like a crappy woodworker. In fact, I'm a certified expert when it comes to the domino. Here's undeniable proof. Hey, I wanna show you one really cool trick about the domino. This point right here is exactly the center horizontally of where this bit will drill a mortise. Which means if you wanted to put a domino in the center of this board, I drew this crosshairs, you can line up your domino like this, and even though you can't see where the domino is going to be, it will be centered on this line. And what's also cool is on the base plate, there are these lines here. Here's the center line. So I can line up the center line right there, and I've got the center line right there. So if I were to plunge this down, I could put a domino directly there. Now, why does that matter? I already have my mortises drilled here, and I need to put a domino here, but I can't reference a surface like I did the other ones. And my issue is I don't have a place to reference. I drew a line so it would be offset. So now I can set the bottom of that base against this line, which means the center line will be there. And then I did my best to try to square up 90 degrees. So in theory, I can place my domino machine right here on this line and I should get a centered domino. That's the theory. I've never done this before, but I think, I hope it's gonna work. We'll find out. Well, the fact that I'm staring at you, not looking happy means one thing. See, what happened was I knew that that distance from the bottom plate of the domino to the center was 10 millimeters, but I didn't have a metric ruler handy, so I used an imperial, and I thought I'll just mark a pencil line. Let me show you what happened. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an off-center domino because instead of this line being 10 millimeters, it's almost 12. This is what I should have done. I should have taken my calipers and locked them at 10 millimeters, and then I should have marked a line off of that. So what I'm going to do to fix this is I'm going to glue one of these in, and then I'm gonna try again. So something you hear all the time, and it's true, is that woodworking is not about being perfect. Woodworking is about making mistakes and knowing how to fix them and hide them, and then not feeling like you suck. Speaking of feeling like you suck, sometimes the answer is right in front of you. I was using 10 millimeter dominoes for this project. Dude could have used a 10 millimeter domino to measure the offset line instead of a ruler or calipers, just saying. 
Now, I know that a lot of times YouTubers will actually intentionally mess up projects or make mistakes so that they can appear relatable or just have more engagement or interesting videos. And I promise you, that is not what is happening here. This is a legitimate how not to do any of this video because, you know, I'm not a beginner woodworker. I've been building stuff for a long time, but I'm not like, I don't know if I'd even say I'm an intermediate woodworker. I, I literally just, I make a lot of mistakes because... I don't know. I'm not that smart when it comes to this stuff. So if you made it to this far of the video, we call this part of the video the deep end. It's like the deep end of the pool. I'd love to know, is it helpful to leave some of these mistakes in? Or would you prefer that I cut the mistakes out and just show you a polished project? Leave a snorkel emoji or just say the word snorkel and I'll know that you have a great attention span and you've made it this far in the video. I was scratching my head on how I'd attach this base to the top and I found these beauties that Izzy Swan makes. He calls them the Izzy Swan Skirt Washers. I'm a big fan of these washers, just not a big fan of the name because Izzy in a skirt doesn't seem right. I was afraid the hickory would be a little too yellow or orange if I put a clear coat of finish on, so I used Rubio 5% White. And while I was finishing the base on my flat workbench, I discovered that the base sits uneven, just barely. Like you can fold a receipt up and level it. Missed it by that much. I somehow got legs three and four out of alignment when gluing up. So time for another skill builder. And I learned this trick from Jerry on Keith Johnson's channel. You recess a threaded insert into a hole that is a bit wider than a threaded foot and voila, you have a concealed leveling foot that no one knows about. Once again, woodworking is about fixing and hiding your mistakes. It had been a week and it was time to pick up the slab from the kiln. Not only were the bugs dead, but the moisture content dropped from 13 to 14% to 9.8%. Without Danny, there's no way this top was coming inside my house. It was finally time to see the top and the base together and I couldn't wait. And there's no way around it. I hate it. There's a couple of things wrong. First, the top is significantly thicker than the legs of the base, and it feels too top heavy, especially from this angle. Second, the clean white hickory just doesn't match the ruggedness of the pecan top. The materials look mismatched. Last, the width of the top is too wide in relation to the stance of the base. Now I could trim it down, but I'd lose a lot of the character that I was trying to preserve and that kind of makes this top special. Off camera, I made a smaller top from some leftover hickory and you can see that this looks way more natural and doesn't have any of the three issues. So instead of making one side table, I guess I accidentally made two and I'm going to permanently match this new top to the base. And even though I don't want to do it, I think I'm going to have to figure out something else for the base for the pecan top. I needed to get started on the epoxy pour on the top, so that gave me some time to step away from the base and figure out the best way forward. I've been making videos on YouTube for about three and a half years now, and I'm grateful to say that I'm officially an official YouTuber. Not because of this thing, but because of this. I'm finally going to try epoxy for the first time. Total boat, baby! Jerry, stay off my channel. Well, since I'm an epoxy virgin, I asked four different woodworkers who have lots of experience with this stuff how I should approach fixing this top. And I was shocked. All four told me the exact same thing. And that was to seal the areas I needed to pour epoxy into with a thin coat of Total Boat High Performance first. And that will eliminate bubbles coming from that area. And then after that's dry, I can do a deep pour on top of that without the high risk of bubbles. And so that's what I did. If you remember from my festival trip, I used the Shaper Origin to cut out these stitches, but I don't have a Shaper Origin. However, I do have a 3D printer. And my pal Seth made a matching pair of templates. It was actually pretty easy making stitches using that. The trim router wasn't too bad, except for the dust collection. And this part was really messy, but thanks to my friend, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Thanks to my friend, Jason Bent, 
I have a clever solution to all the dust going into the air. A while back, Jason told me about this American startup company called Grit Automation. They make a smart hub that allows you to do a lot of cool things like automate your existing blast gates, turn on your dust collector, etc. And those are cool, but there's this little known thing that they do. And I've always wanted this, but I didn't know it was possible. They have a tool trigger that has an air quality sniffer inside of it. So if you hook this up to a shop air filter and you connect it to their app, you can have it automatically turn on your air scrubber anytime you use a specific tool or if certain air particles measure above an activation threshold. So it's like always sniffing the air and when it senses that the air is dirty, it'll turn on your scrubber to clean the air, which I think is amazing. I usually forget to turn on my air filter when I'm working, so Grit did me a solid by inventing this. As the people in New England say, it's wicked. Speaking of weird language and sayings, do you ever feel old when you hear kids talk? I remember whenever I was younger, we would have odd ways of talking, and when my friends and I were around older people, they would get confused by the language we were using, and we'd have to explain to them what we meant. For example, if something was good, we wouldn't say it was good. We'd say, oh man, that's bad. And bad didn't mean bad, bad meant good. And if something was really good, we wouldn't say it was great. We'd say it was fire, not on fire, just fire. And if it was amazing, straight fire. You following, fam? Fam was short for family. It was fun feeling young. I remember when things went off the rails and I started to feel old. It was when my friends would say something was cray cray instead of crazy. I don't understand that. You removed one letter, Z, but then you need to repeat the word cray. Aren't you supposed to be a lazy millennial? You're doing more work saying cray cray than if you just said crazy. It's to the point now where I don't even know what my kids are saying and I feel like I'm 98 years old and out of cultural relevancy. Instead of telling me I'm wrong, my kids will just say, that's cap. What's cap? I, I don't get it. Eh, they're so extra. And right now, I keep hearing people talk about brat. I'm 40. I know I'm not a youngster anymore, but what the heck is going on? What is brat? I asked a friend of mine who will remain nameless if he could explain brat to me, and he said, quote, if you have to ask what brat is, you're not brat. Then he sent me a TikTok clip of CNN's oldest correspondent explaining what brat means. I told him thanks for the help and that I was sorry for interrupting his pattern plywood session. So, like an old person, I had to Google what brat means. And apparently, it means that you're bold, that you take risks, and that you embrace the uncomfortable. The core focus of brat is edgy, imperfect, and yet confident. I'm not sure how the word brat means any of that, but this is so dumb. I spent so much time trying to figure out what brat means, and all Michael Lom needed to say was, Jason Bent is brat. And then I would have understood immediately. Imperfect and yet confident. So as you can see, I ended up making another base, but this time out of walnut. And I think, the jury's still out, but I think it's gonna work better. And the reason why I chose walnut, besides it being my favorite wood, is that I think it'll talk to the stitches and it'll make this piece seem more cohesive. So when I show you the end result in a moment, let me know what you think. Now here's the moment of truth. This deep port epoxy has been curing for five days which means for five days, I don't know if I ruined the entire project or not. I won't know until I plane things down. And the thing I'm the most worried about with this epoxy is bubbles or a failed cure because it takes so long to do and I'm kind of under a time crunch. I ran it through the drum sander what seemed like a hundred million times. And then I sanded the scratch marks out for an ungodly amount of time. And while I hate sanding, it was very satisfying to get to this point where I think we may have pulled it off. I'm still not entirely sure because it looks kind of cloudy, but I'm hoping that as I sand in higher grits, it'll polish up nicely. But again, I'm an epoxy rookie. I don't know what I'm doing. Now this part is embarrassing. The caulk made its way into the epoxy by about a quarter of an inch. So it's not ideal. And fortunately, it's another problem to solve, kind of frustrating. I thought about using a circle routing jig to cut about a half an inch off of that side alone, but I found an extra 3D printed template part from the leg assembly, and I thought that this slight angle might help me make an organic shape while preserving the overall diameter. So I figured I'm gonna try that one first. If you've never routed epoxy, one, it's really messy. 
and B, it feels like routing through butter. Shamelessly, I thought this would be a great use case to show how my vac trim attachment for our new router plate can shine in situations like this where you're flush trimming. So I took some before and after just to kind of show you how effective this is with a dust extractor. And then I took it off so you could see some of these beauty shots with the router bit. Now, after some amateur carving and shaping with the Rotex sander, it was time for some obligatory CA glue filler shots in 4K, which apparently is a requirement for epoxy videos on YouTube. I'm not trying to get demonetized here. And before I show you the final result, if you like this type of content, why not join the 133,000 other people who have subscribed to this dumb channel? Now, I'm not asking because I want more subscribers. I ask because often the videos that resonate the deepest with my audience have the highest subscribe rate, and that data tells me what types of content most people want to see more of. So it's more like a help me help you type of thing. Now, call me cray cray, but I don't need more subscribers. We're kind of full at the moment. I've stopped counting them. So only follow if you really mean it and dig the vibe here. Did I just say cray cray on YouTube? Oh my gosh. While the childhood dream of having a pecan tree with a fort in it for my kids didn't pan out, I think I ended up with something better. I needed my friend Gus to cut down the tree and I needed Johnny to cut the slab for me. I needed my festival friends to inspire me with this design. I needed Seth to design the template and Danny to kill the bugs, Chris, Keith, Blake, and Cam to answer my epoxy questions. I needed Hayden to film me while I worked and Rick to give me some walnut. I needed Mr. Cool to save me from the heat and I even needed Jason Bent to tell me about grit. Woodworking doesn't have to be a solo sport. It's the people, not the pecan, that make the difference in our life. And I'm grateful to have the best woodworking friends in real life and online. Because we is greater than me every time, in life and in woodworking. We need each other. So go make some friends, be a friend, and make something beautiful and share it with the world, even if it's from a trash piece of wood. Just make sure it doesn't have bugs.